Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the CEO of the Tom Price Foundation and also the guest of honor of today's press conference. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, online viewers worldwide, welcome to 2018 Tom Price Award Announcements. From June 18th to the 21st, the Tom Price Foundation is announcing the laureates of the 2018 Tom Price in Sustainable Development, Biopharmaceutical Science, Sinology, and Rule of Law. In today's press conference, the 2018 Tom Price Laureate in Rule of Law will be unveiled. To begin with, we would like to introduce the guests of honor who are here with us today. Please first welcome Dr. Lin Ziyi, Director and Distinguished Research Professor at Institutum Jurisprudential of Academia Seneca. Professor Xie Shiming from Department of Philosophy of National Chongqing University. Dr. Wang Pengxiang, Associate Research Professor at Institutum Jurisprudential of Academia Seneca and Dr. Chen Zhenquan, CEO of the Tom Price Foundation. And now we would like to invite Dr. Chen Zhenquan, CEO of the Tom Price Foundation, to give us the opening remarks. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the foundation and the founder, Dr. Samuel Yin, I welcome all of you uh, to the 2018 uh, Ten Prize Award announcement for rule of law. Where there is a society, there is law. Law is a necessary element in the fabric of our social lives. The Ten Prize Foundation is honored to set up a world-renowned award on this theme to award outstanding individuals or organizations for their innovation and contributions and to encourage people to work together. The foundation also extends special thanks to the hardworking, fair, and professional international selection committee. Congratulations to the 10 prize laureates to be announced and wishing all of you uh, the very best. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Chen. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to invite Director of Institutum Jurisprudential of Academia Seneca, Dr. Lin Ziyi, to announce the 2018 Tom Price Laureate in Rule of Law for us. Distinguished guests, member of the media, I'm now honored to announce that the recipient, the 2018 Tom Prize in Rule of Law is Joseph Ross. <laughs> he is awarded for his past breaking uh, contribution to the rule of law and for deepening our understanding of the very nature of law, legal reasoning, and the relationship between law, morality, and freedom. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lin. Next, please join me to welcome Professor Xie Shiming from National Chongqing University to introduce the Tom Price Laureate in Rule of Law and to tell us about his significant contributions. Uh, thank you. It's my honor to be here um, to um, say a few words about um, Professor Ra's work. Um, he's a legal philosopher, basically, and um, um, over maybe 40, 50 years, he has accumulated um, a bundle of deep philosophical work on law, basically, 
um, which is very complicated, so maybe uh, today it will take a few minutes uh, for me to explain that to you. Um, Professor Ross was uh, born in 1939. Uh, basically, he uh, was educated in, in Britain uh, for his undergraduate degree and PhD. Um, since 1985, um, uh, he has been a professor um, of law at Oxford University. Um, and then he retired in 2006. Um, but since 2002, um, he was uh, appointed uh, at Columbia University Law School. Uh, I've been teaching there uh, since then. And also uh, teach um, since 19, uh, 2011 uh, in King's College London. Um, um, and his uh, major contribution, basically, I would say, is in legal practical philosophy. Um, um, he has written on many, many topics. Uh, but uh, the major contribution, um, I would say, um, for time's sake, uh, includes the following um, six. Okay, one is the rule of law. Um, uh, the second is legal positivism. Uh, the third is legitimate authority. The fourth is normativity, and then reasons and uh, professionalist liberalism. Um, since 1971, he has written ten books, okay, and which I think contain all his major contributions to the areas that I just mentioned. So briefly, you can see. Um, and by the way, you know the the pictures, the, the cover, the, the basically uh, are pictures that Ross himself took. Uh, he's a very good uh, photographer, but you know, not just a good legal philosopher. Basically, um, these are 10 books, um, and very dense to read, and it's very uh, difficult to read. Um, basically, all of them are collection of essays, um, and, and Ross write in a way that is very typical in, um, in late 20th century uh, philosophy circle. Um, they write essays, articles, um, and each essay sort of grew out of uh, his major concerns on law and uh, legitimate authority. You know, whenever he see a, a problem that comes out of his previous work, he would then take on uh, the work and, and, and write another essay you know, to solve his own problems or problem that raised by his critics. Um, so let me uh, start with um, rule of law. Um, Roth uh, basically um, confined the focus of the rule of law. Well, rule of law is a, a very important political idea in our time. Uh, he confined the focus of rule of law on a formal and procedural um, aspect you know, or principles that regulate government or political institutions. So I would say, um, or people often say, you know, his conception of rule of law is a, a formal one or a very thin one, it's a minimum one, okay? Um, so the basic idea is this. Uh, law must be capable of being, being obeyed, uh, or law must be capable of guiding the behavior of the subjects. This is a very simple idea, uh, very thin. You know, it doesn't contain many sort of uh, values that people usually would associate with the rule of law, okay? But it's thin, but it's very powerful. All of, all of all many, many principles that we are familiar with um, uh, or associated with the rule of law can be derived from this very thin and basic idea. Okay, law must be able to, or must be capable of being obeyed or being able to guide people's behavior. Um, and it's thin, it has, it, you can derive many principles also, it, it's, has great value, okay, as we will see uh, later. Um, and in, in contrast to this thin and formal concept of rule of law, um, we have many sort of fat or substantial conception of law, uh, such as this one. Uh, let me read it. Um, the function of, for example, the function of legislature in a free society under the rule of law is to create and maintain the condition they will uphold the dignity of man as an individual. 
And this dignity requires not only the recognition of his civil and political rights, but also the establishment of social, economic, educational, and cultural conditions, which are essential to the, for the full development of his personality. This is a typical fat, substantial conception of the rule of law. It concerns many, many things. And Ross earned, you know, urged us to avoid to adopt this sort of fat conception of law. Um, uh, we, look, in, in philosophy, the, the, the sound or the, um, the wisdom is that um, you, you start with a very thin um, concept. So it won't be fooled. Okay, you won't be led, misled to uh, believe that uh, values or political ideals cannot conflict. Okay, many people would put human rights, democracy, you know, equality, many good things into the concept of the law. And uh, this kind of policy would, um, would have uh, bad theoretical results. So, so um, in reverse to this kind of uh, um, a train of thinking, uh, Rods adopt or develop uh, this very thin idea of rule of law. And um, next, and uh, as I just mentioned, you know, many familiar principles that are related to the rule of law can be derived from that concept, that idea, um, that law must be capable of being obeyed. Um, and here are a list of principles, and it's not exhaustive, and we may go on if we need to uh, say, uh, Number one, all laws should be prospective, open, and clear, um, as you can see, so that the law can really guide people's behavior. Okay? It's, it's opaque, you know, no one understands the content of the law, then people don't know how to act. Second, law should be relatively stable, you, know, um, you cannot change the law you know, frequently, so people don't know what now law is. Third, uh, the making of particular law, particular uh, legal order should be guided by open, stable, clear, general rules. You know, you have some higher rules that should be general, that guide how to make laws. Uh, number four, the independence of the judiciary must be guaranteed. Okay, that's obvious. Five, um, the principle of natural justice must be observed. You know, natural justice means like, you know, um, open, fair hearing absence of bias, you know, so again, you know, these are qualities that law should have so that people know how to behave. Um, number um, six, the court should have review power over the implementation of other principles, okay. And seven, the courts should be easily accessible, you know, people should be able to use court if they need to. Uh, number eight, um, the discretion, okay, this is important, the discretion of the crime preventing agency you know, like police, prosecutors, um, should not be allowed to pervert the law. You know, they, they should not select cases they, you know, they think um, they like um, to pursue. Um, so these are sort of familiar principles that associate with the rule of law. Um, and as I say, you know, the, the, the thing, the basic idea of rule of law um, is, is very valuable. It's, it's, it's thin, but it's important. Uh, let's see the next one. Um, so let me quote some of the sort of sentences and passages from Russ. He says that observance of the rule of law is necessary if the law is to respect human dignity. Okay. And there are many ways to respect, protect human dignities, but the rule of law is an sort of essential one. Okay. Um, second, he says that observance of the rule of law presuppose, okay, presuppose that People are rational, autonomous creatures, and uh, you know, attempt to so the, the observance of rule of law attempt to affect their action and habits by affecting their deliberation. You know, people are autonomous, rational. So this is basically so the idea, underlying idea of the ba the rule of law, you know, to respect people as autonomous, rational being. Um, and next, there are one more, uh, two more uh, passages. He says that conformity to the rule of law is an inherent value of laws, indeed. It is their most important value. And the, va the rule of law is, is the specific um, excellence of the law. Law might have many other virtues, but so the, the rule of law is, is the most important one. 
basically his idea is that the rule of law is understood as, as you know by by uh, the principles that I mentioned above um, will prevent the danger or the evils the law itself is likely to give rise to law is a powerful means the government has and it can do many many bad things as well not just good things to prevent those bad things evils from from occurring, the rule of law is a very important idea to regulate lawmaking uh, institutions or the judiciary. Okay, um, so the rule of law is sort of inherent uh, virtue in that sense. Um, then he says, since it's a moral requirement when necessary to enable law to perform useful social functionings, okay, law is a good instrument to pursue many good things. Um, so people to be able, you know. People able to follow the law, government can follow the law, it's very important so that once you have a law and, and people know how to follow it, so good thing can be realized. And that's why the rule of law is so important. Um, so conformity to the rule of law is virtually always of great moral value, okay, since law can be an important means to valuable social goals. So this is basically his idea of um, of the rule of law, okay, and the thing one, and I think it poses a great challenge to those who want to advocate a thicker, a, a more substantial um, conception of the rule of law. You know, how you can go beyond this and and not um, slip into um, some murky, you know, some um, some confusing thinking, um, etc. Okay, and whether the the thing concept of law is enough. Um, um, the next uh, area of contribution um, is um, is uh, his um, his version of legal positivism, um, and the basic idea of legal positivism is this: the existence and content of law depends on social facts and not on its merits. Okay, it doesn't matter whether the law is good or bad. You know, to identify um, w which rule is the law, we can only rely on social facts. You know, what the legislature has done at any particular time. You know, what the court has, what decision court has made, uh, which case, etc. And these are all social facts that can be observed, can be sort of um, um, see by empirical. Uh, investigation rather than by moral arguments. Okay, um, um, and, and legal positivism has been severely criticized uh, since it was proposed. Okay, um, it has been since it's proposed. So uh, one sort of um, common misunderstanding of legal positivism is is to confuse legal positivism with a very sort of strange, absurdly so-called formalistic doctrine of law, according to which law is always clear and however pointless um, or wrong, uh, it should be you know, uh, rigorously applied by officials and obey. This is a sort of blind obedience to law. Uh, that has frequently attributed to legal positivism. And so far, I don't think any sort of sensible legal positive has advocated that view. Okay, law should be always, you know, no matter how pointless, how wrong, it should be obeyed uh, and uh, applied. Um, can you go back to the previous one? Um, yeah, here you, you can see the, this is the tradition. You know, philosophers who are writing in the tradition of legal positivism since 19th century. You have John Austin, you have Bentham, then you have German scholar Gelson, then British legal philosopher Hart, and then Roth's and Roth sort of, you would say, sort of developed a robust version of legal positivism, and that is sort of a great contribution to this tradition. Um, and uh, and from my point of view, Roth's version of legal positivism is the best version so far we have uh, of legal positivism, and that again, you know, uh, create a formidable challenge to those philosophers who want to defend non-positivism, okay, like um, one well, of the Wokan has said, but uh, follower of the Wokan, you know, natural law traditions, legal philosopher, have to face uh, 
Ra's version of legal positivism, and I think that's his great contribution to philosophy. Um, um, can we see the next? Yeah. All right, now. Um, um, his legal and political, political philosophy can be summarized in a very, very simple um, um, slogan. Uh, I would say it's called um, law as authority. Okay, and, um, and I, I think this is a very concise um, uh, slogan. Um, his concern is to explain what you know, law as authority means, you know, what, what this idea means. Um, um, and, and this idea is this, law necessarily claim authority, okay? This is a very simple claim, again, just like we, we, we've seen um, in the rule of law. Um, so law necessarily uh, claims authority. Law as law must claim authority. Uh, if any agent or any um, um, does not claim authority, then it's, it's not a legal authority, I would say. Uh, so in his lifetime, he's trying to um, explain what this claim means. You know, wh what do we mean by law necessarily claim authority? What it means, what, what it implies, and what it presupposes, um, and um, you know how it can be defended. Okay. Um, so Rats put forward, I would say, put forward in, in as I say, he has ten books. Basically, he's trying to sort of explain what what it means, you know, what it entails, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And he put forward and argued rigorously. Um, um, many so now well-known theses. Okay, there are many many other theses that sort of relate to this idea, law of authority. Okay, um, and this map basically uh, shows you um, sort of his. You know, philosophical edifice. You know, he has sort of over years writing papers and books to sort of defend that central idea, and and sort of these are sort of the major thesis that has been developed, okay, by by Ross in his writings. Okay, so this is the picture we can see, and and now let me sort of highlight some of the sort of the main sort of um, thesis, interesting thesis, and his argument for it. Okay. Um, philosophy is not the medicine, you know. Like medicine is easy, you know. Cancer X Y Z has been, you know, solved, you know, by this finding. You know, the philosophy is something that you have to go through the, the argument to know, you know, whether a particular point is reasonable, acceptable. It's not something like very concrete thing like cancer has been um, cured by some drugs or research. Um, so let me let me say uh, a few things about um, this sort of um, the idea of legitimate authority. You know, law necessarily claim authority. To be uh, precise, law necessarily claim legitimate authority. Okay, but what what do we mean by legitimate authority? And, and Ross sort of proposed um, um, several theses about this legitimate authority. Uh, number one is called dependent thesis. It's very difficult, but we have to go through it you know, to see the beauty of his philosophy. Um, authoritative directives, you know, legislation, for example, okay, um, should be based on uh, reasons that already apply to the subject of the directives. Okay, that's depend you know, reasons for legislation depend on the reasons people have. Okay, the legislature does not have its own reason. Okay, it's um, rely on what reasons people have. The second one is very famous one. It's called normal justification thesis. The normal way to establish that a person has authority over another person involves showing that the alleged subject is likely better comply with reasons that apply to him if he accepts the directives rather than if he does not. Okay, so this is the you know authority is a very very important uh, uh, requirement. To be authority, you have to have ability, in a sense. You know better than your subjects. So if your subjects follow your directives, they will sort of conform to the reasons they have than if they sort of find out what reason they have to do by themselves. So this is the uh, famous normal justification thesis. And the third one is called preemption um, thesis. Okay, it's about the nature of authoritative directives. 
The fact that an authority requires performance of an action is a reason for its performance. Okay? Law wants to do A, and that's reason for you to do A. Which is not to be, okay, and this reason is very special. Okay? This is a, a, a very interesting um, features of legal reasons. Uh, which is not to be added to other relevant reasons when assessing what to do. Okay? Um, but should exclude and take place of some other reasons that you have. Okay, so, so the legal reason replace the reasons, okay, exclude the reasons that we have, you know. Law as authority has this status, you know, you follow my directives, okay. Take what I say as a reason to do it, okay, just because I say it. If I am the authority, if I have the legitimate authority, okay, that's the idea. Um, okay, this, um, let me, let's go to the next one. This, this is, so far, if it's clear, what's the argument for that, okay? And I say, in philosophy, argument is the call, the thing, okay? Um, here he says that, since the moral force of the law, law claim legitimate authority, since the moral force of the law, its moral claim to our attention, derived from the moral authority, if any, of the authorities which make it into law, then he say, it follows, the content of law can be identified without resort to moral arguments. The, the conclusion is that it's the sort of, um, it's the positivism thesis. Law, the existence and content of law can be identified um, by social facts alone, not by its merits. So that's the conclusion. So law of authority has this sort of conclusion. Um, the content of law can be identified without resort to moral arguments. Okay, that's the conclusion. And next one. Um, this is a longer version of this argument, okay, um, um, to separate, I'm not going to read it, but, but um, uh, basically this is the idea um, to show why legal positivism um, is a plausible position to accept, okay. Uh, and this is, sort of, I would say, is the master argument, okay. Now let's move to the uh, next area of the um, of, of Roth's uh, contribution. It's um, it's called normativity and reasons. The idea of reasons occur many times if you pay attention to what I what I say. Um, and this is a very interesting area that Roth has contributed to. Um, I think he holds a philosophical position called reasons fundamentalism. Okay, so the concept of reason is very basic in normative discourse. Okay. You ought to do something, something's good. This, this, this kind of discourse we call normative discourse. And the idea of reason is the key to understand those sentences, those normative value, evaluative sentences. And this is it says that all normative phenomena are normative in as much as, and because they provide reasons, or are partly constituted by reasons. Okay, so this is anything that's normative has something to do with reasons, and because it's something to do with reasons, it is normative, okay? So we go back to the, 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 uh, the um, um, service conception of legitimate authority, we talk about people have reason, you know, that they just did it's not its own reasons, etc. Um, that shows that the, the notion of reason is very central to his philosophy, okay? This is a very famous thesis. Um, let's see the next one. Um, Let's focus on the last two um, um, uh, statements. Uh, he says, if authoritative directives, you know, law, for example, are made with legitimate authority, they provide exclusionary reasons and to abrogate obedience, okay? So this idea of um, exclusion reason is the uh, central uh, feature of uh, law, of authority directive, okay? It's so he, he, uh, he sort of basically appealed to or used uh, idea of reason to, to illuminate the notion of authority. Um, law for him, law plays a mediating role between authority and its subject and preserving both authority and autonomy. Okay, that, that is the role of um, law. And that would uh, take us to um, all right, let's, let's skip that cartoon. And let's move to um, his contribution in political philosophy, you know, personal autonomy, and the relation between authority and autonomy, because usually people think this is sort of 
conflict and you know, incompatibility between authority and autonomy. And autonomy is so important a value in our time. So how Roth would react to that kind of uh, puzzle or challenge. Um, the contribution uh, um, in political philosophy um, by Roth is called perfectionist liberalism. Okay. Um, it's professional liberalism. It's a version of liberalism, um, um, which is different from a sort of very popular, familiar uh, version of liberalism called political liberalism. And political liberalism the idea is that the state, the government, should be neutral with respect to competing conception of good life. Okay, you know, people have different sort of uh, conception of what a good life is. You know, people have different religious, for ex religious belief, for example. Um, political liberalism thinks that the state should be neutral, stay out of this debate about what a good life is. Okay, um, uh, and and according to political liberalism, that's required by justice. Okay, a just government should be neutral. Okay, Ross opposed that idea. Okay, he opposed political liberalism. He thinks that um, um, justice does not require neutrality. What justice requires is pluralism. Okay. It requires a, the av availability of a choice among incompatible but valuable ways of life. You know, the government has the sort of not just negative duty to respect people's autonomy, but positive duty to provide, to provide, to sustain social conditions that would sort of um, help people or, um, to have a equitable range of valuable form of life to choose. And to choose a valuable form of life is autonomy. Um, he thinks that's the sort of the the major um, duty of the government. Okay, um, so he says that um, the government has a duty to protect, indeed, to actively advance individual autonomy. Political action should be concerned with providing mean the means by which individual can pursue and achieve their freely chosen conception of the good. Um, so that's his sort of contribution to uh, political philosophy. And the debate between political liberalism and uh, professionalist liberalism is still going on. And, and Ross' version, again, from my judgment, is the best version of sort of professionalism in politics. Okay, and so for those people who follow John Ross, defending political liberalism, again, you face sort of Ross, uh, Ross um, um, Position. So let me let me um, now conclude by saying a few words about the overall contribution uh, by Rods. In the past 50 years, Joseph Rods has acquired his reputation as one of the most accurate, inventive, and energetic scholars currently at work in analytical, legal, moral, and political philosophy. He has made an unprecedented contribution to the development of the tradition of legal positivism and has created a formidable challenge to his critics. His work on the authoritative nature of law has systematically deepened and broadened our understanding of the normativity of law. And his work on the autonomy of law and the evaluative nature of legal reasoning has shed new light on the complex relation between law and morality, and the subtlety and power of his reflection on many legal, moral, and political topics, such as the rule of law, legal rights, legal interpretation, the methodology of legal theory, negligence and responsibility, the connection between practical reason and the theory of value, human rights and sovereignty, democracy, have made his writings widely studied and as well as invaluable source for anyone working in legal, moral, and political philosophy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Xie. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us at the 2018 Tan Prize Award announcement in Rule of Law. The Tan Prize Award ceremony will be held on September 21st in Taipei this year. We look forward to seeing you then. Thank you. We will now take a short break. The press conference in Chinese will begin in a moment. <laughs>